You will be listening to Samuel Edward Conkin III, the editor of New Libertarian Notes and former Libertarian Party Radical Caucus organizer, speaking at CounterCon 2 on May 23, 1975, in Cheshire, Massachusetts. Mr. Conkin will be discussing his basic theory of counter-economics as a route to achieving a free society. We will now go to the podium where Mr. Conkin is speaking. Mainly I'm starting off the talks like I did last year because it was my, the idea of counter-economy was essentially my idea, or at least the label. Although it does have an interesting background and it does have other people having put it, put it forward. Um, some of you, I would say the majority of you, probably have, were not here in the last CounterCon. So for their benefit, I'm going to run through briefly what counter-economics is and where it came from. And for the, uh, those of you who have heard it before, I will try to make it brief. Uh, specifically, according to Neil's topic listing, I'm supposed to then talk on a specific application, which uh, deals with crises uh, that we see arising in the immediate future. So that'll be sort of the second half. Now, it arose, the idea of counter-economics arose from several things. You can take uh, intellectual ideas from, liber from the libertarian movement, but to be pr quite frankly, it arose, uh, as most of my ideas have, in the hot crucible of, uh, of battle. In this particular case, in the battle, in the struggle we were waging against a strange cancer that was entering into the movement, a plague known as the Libertarian Party. And in our battle against it, one of the things that I had found that I had required was, um, was an argument, an answer to the specific argument, which is how do you get from here to there? Okay. The Libertarian Party claimed to have an answer. Okay. Um, so uh, maybe we got to go back a little further than that. Before that, say up to 1969, 1970, the real battle was to show that there was some place you were going, okay, that there was in fact a free society and somebody could picture it. Uh, two people especially were very good at drawing, shall we say, word pictures and convincing people that such a place, such a, uh, an end stop or a destination stop in the progress of humanity was in fact possible, one of whom is um, living in New York and not terribly well at the moment, intellectually anyway. And the other one, of course, is, Doc, uh, is Sir Robert Lefebvre. Uh, I think, in fact, it is very significant that Mr. Lefebvre is here because of all our mentors of the pre-69-70 period, he is the only one who remained utterly hardcore and utterly self-consistent and did not never yield at any circumstances or point to the blandishments and sed seductions of the, of the party. Uh, so we certainly have uh, appreciated him, at least in New York or at least among our group. Now, in this, when the struggles came, as I said with the party, the, one of the answers we had to come up with was what, what was, what was uh, getting from here to there like. The there, of course, I assume we, most of us are aware, is the uh, society in which exchanges are free. Some of us may have protection agencies, others may in fact eschew them. Uh, so, but basically the idea is there is no monopoly of legitimized coercion, which we call a state, and uh, the basic fabric of society is constructed by free mutual exchanges on, on, in everything. Uh, material goods, psychic values, for those silib, silib people here. Um, and um, this is in fact it. The, the society as we see it is structured as a vast open marketplace on all levels, or as the Greeks would call it, the agora. Uh, so as we move, so our end point, or at least one stop point, uh, perhaps we'll progress from there, is the agora. What we are living in now, of course, is a certain state of hell. And the question is, how do you get from here to there? Okay, now the answers can come from many sources, one of which was, say, take, take our forerunners in the field, the left anarchists, who have some kinship to us. Their arguments were kind of interesting. They, just, they essentially p pursued either, depending on their proclivities, a violent method of simply saying, well, the state's fire shooting at me, I'll shoot back. And, of course, finding out the state had more guns at the time. Uh, that one was more, really very popular. It was more into the nihilist. The other form that they used, and those c akin to them that they used, which was much more effective, as it turned out, was the nonviolent approach. And uh, that was basically just simply resisting the state, going off into their communes, for example, living the way they wanted to, and so forth. They, they fell apart for internal reasons, domestic reasons. But relative to the state and the state's intervention, they turned out to be quasi-successful. Uh, not too many of them were put down, and in the end, the tactic that was started by these people was used by a man named Gandhi to drive the British Empire out of India, which was a pretty good feat. He didn't. Yeah, yeah but 
they were made to want to. <laughs> we can, we, yeah, we can get into that later. What I'm saying is that the, the, the key thing about this, uh, this episode in history is that the left anarchists actually attempted to apply the principles of their future society. Their society is well, somewhat compatible with us, but not totally. And they view their society as one of mutual exchange, mutual aid, and so forth. But um, what they were applying is tactics from that lifestyle, from that future that they want to live in, to the here and now. I think that is the key thing about it. Now, some people have remarked recently, uh, there's a review coming out in Lose Fair Catalog about uh, Carl Hess's recent book, Dear America. Dear uh, Hess has gone off basically into that type of tangent. But one of the strong points of Hess's position is, in fact, he's arguing about living his life as he portrays it in the future, here and now. He is, you know, operating in this workers, welders, collective, cooperative, or whatever, and in fact, running a welding things actually and exchanging among his friends and. Uh, and uh, not paying tax and so forth. In other words, he is literally living in his anarchy now, or in his neighborhood state, or whatever he called. But again, this is this is part of the problem. Now, the uh, the answers that have been given to us by other people in the libertarian movement have been along the lines of um, what tactics are already in use. In other words, the following tactics have been used in practice on an issue which we now call political, and uh, therefore, uh, which one of these apply in given situations? Uh, some people have advocated armed struggle. Some people have advocated voting. Uh, all of these, unfortunately, have a, a certain... Well, the, each of them are consistent with the goals that the people who introduced them were for. In other words, if you are for, basically, armed struggle on the level of, say, massed armies to overthrow the state, you know, coup d'etat, what you will end up with, of course, as many conservatives have, have constantly pointed out to us, is a, is a revolutionary government which then imposes itself upon other people using the force of arms that they used to take over to now impose themselves on everyone else. Uh, this is, in fact, uh, an end consistent with the goal, with the means. In voting, if you voted in a party of any given label or mixture of letters, including the war letters libertarian, uh, you would, in fact, impose a new group which would now have uh, you know, control of bureaucracy. That's what they're after. They vote for a majority, they get a majority, and they run, run the state. Uh, through a quali supposedly peaceful means, and you end up with somebody running the state. And now you have the interesting characterization that if, in fact, we tried to do that, uh, suppose, for example, we dismantled the state and pulled away some of its power, so we fired a, fired a few soldiers. Suddenly over there, 20, you know, uh, in, in area X or somewhat remote, people started acting in a non-anarchist way according to our judgment. Are we, are we going to send over troops there? Well, we just cut down on the troops. Where do we have the troops to send up there? Obviously, we'll have to pass a tax and raise a levy and have a draft to get, get together enough soldiers to send over there and impose our anarchy, right? Because these people are deviating away from it. Well, you know, it, it begins to be kind of obvious that, that this approach is kind of somewhat nonsensical. It leads immediately to contradictions. Uh, in fact, well, another interesting one that I came up with in a debate with Mr. Greenberg that should have been immediately apparent is that, of course, a political party by its nature has to be a monopoly. If you run two libertarian parties, or whatever names, then you have, in fact, the splitting of the vote. Neither can get a majority, neither can get the power. So one must submit to the other one in order for them to be able to win and impose their political regime. So uh, the libertarian party, the political approach, constantly leads to internal self-contradiction. And, in fact, any means that, that, is go that is not consonant with achieving the free society will lead to such contradictions. Now, this is basically why I attack the Libertarian Party and a few other approaches. Uh, there are other approaches which are not so obviously contradictory, and which I have had, therefore, a lot less to say about. There are other treatises, for example, who like to run off into coral reefs or platforms in the North Sea or into the woods of Oregon to eat hard red winter wheat and 500-gallon drums. Uh, or into Bahamian Islands, which will become tax havens. Uh, <laughs> all of these are um, looking for, as I put it, the promised gulch of Ayn Rand and seeking Zion, the anarcho Zionist, which on one hand seems, you know, if they get there and they, you know, somehow manage to get the arrangements, go, the social and the economic arrangements going, you would think that an anarchy would exist there, uh, perhaps, or a free society or an autarky, or whichever label is uh, turning you on at the moment. Uh, but the question is then, first of all, what about the state outside? Is it not going to attack? You know, I mean, is, 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 this, is this little nest of anarchy, this enclave, libertarian enclave, which is the latest uh, um, example of this disease, will it not in fact be attacked by ex the external state? Will it possibly? And will it be able to defend itself? I don't know. Maybe it will. Maybe it will play off other powers. 
But nonetheless, it's still not a, certainly a takeover society by any means. It's a few people hiding out in an island and maybe or maybe not taking their chances of getting trade. If you were going to do that, why in fact do it in such a visible and isolated method as hiding out on an island? You can do the same thing right here in the United States, almost everything that they are doing there. The difference, and there's no difference in, in fact in the question of risk, because you are either risking a cop here or the Army or the Marines landing over there. Now, in each case, the circumstances may vary. You know, that some cases are riskier than others. I am not going to get busted for walking out in, uh, you know, in, in 90 times out of 100 in uh, Greenwich Village or uh, Madison, Wisconsin or Berkeley if I'm walking around carrying dough because, you know, it's just not the thing. It violates uh, such an action by the local kid pigs would immediately, you know, start up widespread riots in the whole area and it would be totally unmanageable and controllable. The anarchy that exists in the marijuana trade, uh, if the state moved in, would now create chaos, <laughs> uh, if, you know, by, by repression. And similar to other things that are occurring. Um, one, one example that may hit some of you home is the fact that every law, I mean, every act of sex outside of the missionary position with your own wife in a bedroom in almost every state in this union is illegal. Now, how many of you here are not lawbreakers? <laughs> Okay, so we're all, you know, there, there's a large number of people here who are, very, who are already uh, engaged in breaking the law, achieving their psychic profit now, you know, and <laughs> taking it now and taking the risk involved because they feel the reward is worth it. And um, the risk that your neighbor, you know, no, nosy uh, Bertha next door might flip open the curtain and see you and decide to phone the cops. You know, then, and, and because she's jealous or pissed off or whatever, you know, or you cut her lawn last week when you should have been cutting your own, you know, ran over the edge. She decides to turn you in for sex crimes. I don't know. You know, this is a possibility. There is a risk, sure. And uh, there's a risk in anything you do in the society. There is nothing. But, you know, in a sense, the state has made it very easy for me to argue counter-economics. There is nothing that I know of you can do in the society that is not illegal. Let us take the simple act of selling a good. Suppose I sold a good cheaper than anyone else. Okay? If I sell a good cheaper than anyone else, I am a cutthroat competitor. I have violated fair trade laws all over the place. I don't know if they've got it. Have they repealed them in New York yet? Yeah, they probably got some, some, some loophole on the federal level then. But, or in, this, or in the county levels or God knows where. But, no, you know, vast majority of areas, except maybe an enclave or two, you've basically got the fair trade laws to bust me for selling lower than everybody else. If I sell higher than everybody else, that's prima facie evidence that I've got a monopoly and the trust busters are going to be knocking on my door to get, take, take control of my company. If I sell the same price as everybody else, I'm guilty of conspiracy <laughs> with other traders, you know, to restrain, conspiracy and restraint of trade, that's a violation of an act or two, and I'll be hauled off too. So I can neither sell lower or higher nor the same price as anyone else in this country. Therefore, any sale I make is automatically illegal. I've excluded all possibilities. Okay, now in the economic areas and in the sexual areas, we've now, you know, essentially found ne nearly everything to be illegal. And I'm sure if we bothered to investigate other areas, we'd find it similarly. One, one of these days, well, right now it's illegal to use cyclamates, or at least buy them, or sell them. Uh, so if you sweeten your coffee any way but the approved way, you've already had it. And good God knows the sugar rationing may come in with the next war, which I'm sure Dennis will tell us about. And then, in fact, you may be busted for that as well. You know, you may find out that the only way you can do, uh, sweeten your coffee is to buy from your local black market here. You know, pulls it open to sucrose, saffron, or sugar <laughs> <laughs> on, the, on the inside of the jacket. And, you know, this, this is going to be it. Now, I, I personally would love to see that. I'm one of these people who definitely would not like to see b b marijuana legalized. I want to see 90% of the people blowing dope and saying, my God, the pigs are going to uh, get me. The government is my enemy, you know. <laughs> And, and thinking this as they're doing it. People, you know, uh, that, are, that are in the bedroom having a good time when they, they pause for a breather are also maybe thinking, uh, hopefully now and then, that the state may come in and bust us or, or the nosy neighbor would do. There has been some change? Legalize all the The state's trying to co-opt us again. <laughs> but, okay, well, this small step for mankind, I guess. Uh, I think it's, it may also be a response. Disruptive, yeah, in a sense, yeah. Yeah, it's, so the state seems to apply to let us do it. I, now, this to me tend to be a bias, but I think that ultimately the state would yield on nearly every so-called victimless crime that isn't economic. Because ultimately the nature of the state is an, it's an economic plunder. It is, a, it is a thief. It may be a nosy snoop, it may be a censor, you know, it may be a, a religious inquisitor, but ultimately the very uh, hardcore nature of the state is it's a plunderer, it's a thief. 
and it must feel. It will ultimately, if uh, you know, if it feels that it's losing its grip, if you're not coming willingly and dumping every April 15th your, you know, one fifth share of grain or whatever, you know, into the into the king's um, scales. Uh, if anything threatens that, they will yield on every other point. But that is one they can't yield on. That is the ultimate. And the vampire can give up his cloak, you know, and comb his hair, but he's got to have that fix of blood every April 15th. He's got to be able to bite. So the real battle is going to be on the counter-economics. Now, I include in the general term of, you know, the Goric idea, things like psychic pleasure and, you know, uh, drug, sex, and whatever. But I think we ultimately are going to focus on on economics. Okay, this is the basis of counter-economy then. It is, in fact, to live anarchy now, to live the free society now, the libertarian society, the autarchy, by exchanges. Now, how do you start? Okay, you don't form a party, you don't form an organization, you don't get together and pass a constitution. Uh, what happens is, for example, you people could all perform a counter-economic act after this talk by walking up and paying me seven fifty for a new cost for a subscription of libertarian notes, which I will mail to you. None of that money goes for taxes, <laughs> I can assure you. Is, the magazine is totally unregulated, as, as if you read it, you will find out. <laughs> um, some people may say uncontrolled, that's another synonym. Um, Let's see what other things says. Um, in, well, of course, the inflationary problem is not over because I do accept state fiat currency. But if any of you want to give me Kruger rands or some pieces of them, that's fine too. I know. I'll take it. But the point is, is that any act between consenting adults, in which there, all right, let, let me define a counter-economic act. Any act between two consenting adults, in which there is no ter third-party intervention, is, is counter-economic. For example, well, how many of you read Power Market by Murray Rothbard? Not all. All right, let me briefly describe. Rothbard, is, this is sort of an appendage to his uh, Man, Economy, and State, in which he describes economics. In it, he talks about the types of intervention that exist. There's, uh, you know, either I, you and I get together and we fight, you know, instead of exchange, or a third party moves in and uh, chooses to either autistically attack one of us for reasons like, all right, censorship, he moves in and takes your book away. Or he moves in to intervene between two of us trading for the benefit of one of us or the other of us, or maybe to rip both of us off by getting a tax coming and a fee coin, you know. Okay, these are the types of things involved. Well, anything, if, if, an a, if him and I decide to go off and pe uh, you know, peacefully roll to the rest of society and just have a fight over something, you know, that's, that, that does not fall either in the status purview or the economic one. What I'm thinking of is any case in which we perform any exchange in which the state and its minions do not in some way are aware of, or if they're aware of, they do nothing about or can do nothing about, um, is a counter-economic act. Okay, so uh, anything we choose to exchange. Uh, for example, as I said, the magazine, there would also be, I assume, possibly dope dealing, which has gone on in many libertarian conferences, but I'm sure not this one. Uh, there is um, selling of, <laughs> right, the selling of many things, of libertarian t-shirts, I suppose, uh, Canada's got some things and so forth. Okay, this is interesting enough. I mean, people have sort of had this idea, the, uh, the little kicks, the uh, joys and so forth, of uh, the giggle of uh, performing these little illegal acts at a libertarian conference as part of the fun, part of the atmosphere, the milieu. Right? Uh, but where do we get, you know, it can be done a little bit bigger than this, and uh, ultimately it should be. Now, my purview, is, uh, my view of this is macroscopic, rather, as the... Keynesian economists, the establishment economy, which we are counter to, uh, looks at things. There's a macro and a micro way of looking at it. Now, micro, these exchanges go on between us. Um, in a macro scale, what happens at these, looking on these exchanges, is the bo that the trading that is going on, if it begins to expand, in other words, we have third person trading, fourth person trading. Uh, the use of a something which travels around us one by one, whether it is, uh, you know, a fixed ounce of dope in a sealed package or whether it is a uh, ounce of gold, you know, that is perhaps also plastic sealed, so people are going to chip off pieces, as somebody was arguing with me a minute ago. There, there can be ways to settle this. But if this starts getting exchanged in preference to currency because it's being inflated like mad and, uh, you know, some of us demand the harder stuff, uh, if we now purchase, purchase goods, like for example, our friendly black marketeer or gorist, if you prefer, nicer term, uh, farmer, there's a few here I think, somebody who was talking about cows last night, if he decides to run in some milk to, um, you know, for in fact he doesn't have to, he just simply um, grows it or whatever and uh, sells it to someone who then, the anarcho dairyman rushes into town 
and runs him over to the, anar to the Agoras market and um, you know this guy then goes door to door at uh, maybe instead of six in the morning at three in the morning and knocks on the doors and sells the you know the anarcho milk and the, hopefully who knows and someday we'll have nice flag cartons with little black flags on them I don't know it would be the great day <laughs> the great come and get it day yeah. non returnable of course <laughs> and um, Okay, this would be another uh, thing. This is something that I could see happening if the market demand for this particular activity came up, like in uh, times of economic stress where food was being cut off. Uh, if, you know, the depression, hyperinflation situation, which we'll be talking about pretty soon, hits and say there's a uh, food is not getting to New York City because they decide to put price controls on all foods to save the poor, starving poor, you know, the starving poor, poor starving starving poor, and of course immediately the starving poor can't get any food anyway because nobody's crazy enough to bring in the food at a lower than market price, so the starving poor now just die off and solve the problem. But uh, the rest of us who do not wish to be solved in that way may in fact uh, choose to utilize or bring in, run in food, and this has been done in cities all the time, and then certainly in the 20th century, it's a very common act. Uh, before I get into the, the final st the uh, specific example, let me give you a couple of specific examples that have already existed which have in fact part of my inspiration, one of which is um, the Soviet Union. Now a lot of us have gone through a lot of changes in our thinking about the nature of communism in the Soviet Union and other communist countries. Um, one thing that has certainly gone a lot to change my mind is uh, resolving the problem of how, since we all believe in the free market, how does the Soviet Union survive? I mean, without a free market, without some kind of market, without pricing, for example, without exchanges, how can people eat? How can people get anything? We know the state can plunder and build guns and weapons and nukes and, and navy fleets, but how do they feed the people? That can't be done by state edict. You get long lineups of people uh, getting uh, shoddy goods or nothing, you know, going hungry. So how, in fact, do people eat? Well, right from the beginning, the uh, private farm, there was farms, the collective farms were broken up, they were allowed to... Um, have their own little strips of land and grow food. That was a concession, a licensing, if you want the market. But what happened is immediately, as soon as they were allowed even a foot in the door so that they could have any kind of uh, excuse for legally having food that wasn't part of the collectives, immediately black marketeering flourished. Okay, lettuce, tomato, you know, the whole bit. <laughs> and uh, the things went on and everything, uh, you know, up to uh, probably in Russia, I'm sure the black market is so large that you could probably get a MiG-17 or 19 if you wanted to, how bad enough you're willing to pay the right people. And, you know, one day, a slack day in the, uh, in the MiG plant where everybody's half asleep as usual, uh, somebody would walk off with the right parts and <laughs> meet at lunchtime, put them in a suitcase and bring them here, or a few suitcases and send them out to you, you know. This, it's, it's, uh, We've already heard of what Vietnam was like from the, from the point of view of the sergeants of the quartermaster corps. The Soviet Union is one gigantic, you know, uh, Vietnam military camp, and this is in fact going on tremendously. This surfaced, this came to, no, to sort of light in, in an area which became so virulent, the state literally, instead of just, you know, the, the lip service and they're cracking down where they can't do anything about it, where they literally had to retreat. They were driven by the sheer force of the market pressure to retreat in service industries. The rising of service industries in the last 10, 20 years, 30 years in, in the West has now hit the East. People now have a few TV sets, and uh, if they're lucky to live close to the border, they might get something besides uh, the latest portrait of uh, Leonid Brezhnev. And, uh, you know, and then there's a ballet or something, so they want to watch it. And uh, they have toasters and uh, other appliances, electric shavers, and these things are now coming into the Russian market. Well, as we all know here, in the Western market, these things fall apart. <laughs> they have a great tendency to drop screws and, you know, uh, you look at this thing. I didn't put it together. I don't know how it works. <laughs> what do I do with it? I just paid uh, 29.95 in rubles, you know, and Copex for this thing. How do I get it fixed? Okay. Um, well, you can go down to the official state repairman, right, and stand in line for your queue for an hour and a half. That means you miss your hour and a half queue for the bread that you were supposed to get today. So, you know, as a trade-off, you may never get it done. In which case, there's a huge profit to be made. I mean, people are willing to pay far above what may be the market price if there was a, you know, completely free society to have the shaver fixed or the toaster fixed or the TV fixed. Okay, so there are a lot of technicians in Russia, a lot of scientists, engineers. I'm sure some of them are, you know, when they're not goofing off at the office, uh, the commissariat, decide to come home and they, uh, you know, when they come home, they meet somebody who has got a, a razor or TV to be fixed and the guy says, well, I know basically how to do it. Let me see it and I'll work it over. So he fixes it for them. The guy will pay them off for it. He thinks this is a good idea. And then the word spread, and you know, next day, uh, Yvonne meets uh, Yosef, and uh, Yosef says, hey, I got my TV fixed by this engineer friend of mine. I won't tell you who he is because the KGB may be listening, but you know, if you really need to know and uh, you want to put up the money, um, 
so that you're implicated too. <laughs> I don't know whether or not they go through this particular thing at a given time, but ultimately the Im it's implied in everything they do. Um, and the guy says, yeah, but I got a toaster. Maybe he knows how to do that. Sure. And the guy comes over, right? So eventually the engineer may in fact find one day that he's uh, being transferred to the Siberian plant and decide that Siberia is not where he wants to go at all. Uh, his standard of living is much better in Moscow or Odessa or whatever and decides that he's going to hang around there, right? So he says, okay, uh, he lets the engineering job go, he quits, and just lives, and then, you know, goes off and lives off all these repair jobs, which he's probably making far more money than he was getting from the state anyway. And in fact, this is what happened. Uh, th throughout the Russian economy, large numbers of these servicemen begin to appear, utterly illegal, utterly unlicensed, utterly unregulated. They were not part of the great workers' TV repairman cooperative of, of, uh, of uh, the Soviet Socialist Republic of uh, whatever, you know, so therefore they were, they were sinned upon and uh, could be busted or shot or whatever. And this began to grow. Okay, so the state moved against it, said this must stop. They gave speeches at the Council and the Young Pioneers meetings, you know, this, the evil uh, uh, threat of, to our moral structure of the rising of service industry, black market repairmen must be combated, uh, and true Marxist Lenin spirit, you know, this type of thing. And of course that didn't work. <laughs> Uh, so then they, then they may have weighed the guns and so forth. And they found out that not only were people using it, but now some of the commissars were getting their TVs repaired too because they didn't want to wait for the, for the socialist repairman. He probably wasn't doing a damn good job either. In fact, he might have quit already if he was good and already gone to work on the side. So at this point, the Russian government literally fell back. There were a few small articles which libertarians uh, back 1670 began to pounce on, and I was getting them in the mail, and essentially said that the, the, the Russians had retreated. They were now calling on these people to voluntarily turn themselves in and be registered and licensed. They were going to be given the license and the registration, and of course they would have tests to prove their quality and so forth. But they had given up. They could not crush it. The, the market had been so strong, the demand so strong that the Russian secret police, the uh, the KGB and it all its, all its uh, wiles and force could not, in fact, control this area of the market. The mushroom could not be couldn't contained. And so it sprung up, and so it was now they attempted to co-opt it and license it. As far as I know, they haven't succeeded in that either, but they may. Nonetheless, this shows the force of this type of activity, the, uh, the success of it. And these people are living in what I would certainly call agoric circumstances. If, in fact, all transactions every transaction was handled on this basis there would not be a state or effectively there would not be a state because nothing would be regulated nothing would be taxed okay and this is where now I expand outward as I look on the macro view and this is where now we go from your selling and buying to strategy the macro view is if everybody is doing it or let's say in an area or large segments in society are now doing it these people are not paying taxes to the government okay that's not it means the government is not getting fed it cannot pay its uh, it's police, it cannot pay its army, it cannot go around and beat you over the head with a stick because the guy who was supposed to go and beat you over the head with a stick isn't getting paid and he doesn't want to do it for nothing. Some of them might get their kicks that way, but others might figure out they can get a good, better paying job in the Agora. Um, so the state has to, in that sense, die. Now, of course, it may strike, it may tempt to splinters anyway there, but this is a strategy in which you are bringing the, the goal, the end point, the Agora, here and now. In other words, the ends and the means are completely compatible, completely integrated. And this is where I got into it. Okay, this is then the basic, very stripped down version of what the counter economy is like. Uh, right now, it may involve you, if you're a salesman, for example, of uh, products, you might, in fact, choose to sell your products. Um, say you're a door-to-door -door salesman, you may not choose to report a lot of what you sell. And therefore, you're not regulated, not taxed. You may choose to set up things on a uh, liar scale, for example, um, the blind front in another country, which you claim is running, like uh, <laughs> taking all the money that you're making, and you're not taking any of it. You're just an agent or something, and then of course they can't tax it. Um, no, some some specific examples may be given at this meeting. I'm sure in areas like commodities, gold, and what have you, for people talking on that level. Uh, I don't see, I must admit, I don't see in the next year or two people building up steel mills in the backwoods and running in the ingots to town for the, uh, for the agorist uh, car manufacturer and assembly line, but the day may come, and, the day, and it may not come in that quite manner, but it may come in the manner of, uh, say, existing automobile plants simply beginning to disobey more and more regulations as small competitors begin to cut into their market with, you know, homemade jobs or maybe jeeps coming in or, or foreign cars smuggled in or whatever, and they begin to start playing loose with the, uh, the restrictions so that they can uh, try to compete and, you know, probably just pay off the, the inspectors, what have you. So then there are many ways to, in fact, minimize your risk in the, uh, in the counter economy. One is, of course, to bribery as an old, old and established method, which is uh, preferable to the use of force against you. <laughs> You pay uh, off a bureaucrat or a, 
a thug and enforce it directly rather than paying off the state for use purposes of its own. Now, there's a great advantage. This is, I, I grant you, extortion. But there's a fantastic advantage of bribery. Because if you bribe an official, it goes to his pocket, and he's going to spend it his way. And one of the ways he's not going to spend it is building up the army. He's going to spend it on booze or dope or, his, or fast women or whatever, but he's not going to spend it on another tank, on a tank, you know. If you pay off, a sar say, a sergeant occupying your area in a, in a, in a post-war zone, the sergeant isn't going to go buy, you know, spend money for a tank to, to keep up his forces there. He's going to go out and have a good time, you know, or, or maybe invest some money in some dope or whatever. Uh, which is all fine and good. And the man is now also corrupted. You've also got something over him because he's now taken a bribe. And if you're smart, you might have even got enough, uh, you know, set it up such a way you got evidence. So now in the future, you can use a, something against him, at which point he now fears the state. He's committed a counter-economic act, and once you've committed one, <laughs> and so, you know, enough people know about it, you're hooked. Anarchy is irreversible. <laughs> you can be turned in at any time, you see. So now we have the inevitable forces of history on our side once we've started on the counter-economic route. Okay, right, right. Yeah. So the wave of the future keeps surfing along. And, um, okay, this is, so th this is bribery. There are other ways, too. Uh, one of the ways, the best way of protection is, of course, the closed mouth of the community. That may be difficult for some libertarians. Uh, but, not all, of course, but uh, if a community is, uh, has a large, high percentage of this agoric activity going on, uh, eventually everybody refuses, you know, has, can't talk because he'll, if he turns somebody in, there's 15 people that know enough about him to have him sent away for good, you know. So everybody starts shutting their mouth up about everybody else's business, which is, uh, some people would think, a good libertarian society. <laughs> damn, damn good way of running a, a free society. My ob. And, uh, you know, this is a, a method of security as well, the confidential information. Uh, we do have, you get problems. You get problems, for example, in um, information itself, of course, as we know is a good. Advertising is expensive, and that's a, providing information in the marketplace, and it certainly satisfies a function, gets well rewarded. So the question is, how do you advertise the counter economy? Well, word of mouth, perhaps. But there are all sorts of ways of doing it. Um, Jonathan Swift found ways of advertising his uh, philosophical position and distaste with the state by writing a fantasy. Uh, I've, in fact, found ways of expressing uh, some of my uh, raised eyebrows at the activities of the libertarian movement by doing the same thing, which you may read about also in NLN. <laughs> but uh, there, there are all sorts of interesting ways of, of covering this. You could, in fact, have underground bulletins which are passed along hand to hand as opposed to sold you know, openly and everybody disavowing where they came from if, if by some happen the blood, you know, trips across it. Um, word of mouth, and not only word of mouth, but, in, but this could be a specialized function in the market. In other words, one person could, could acquire, go around, make a specialty of acquiring knowledge, you know, going around to agorists and finding out who wants what when, and just doing the entrepreneurial stuff and calling up Joe to tell him that Pete wants uh, X amount of stuff the next day, you know, and he just goes around his function and just be walking around finding out what's going on. And if he's caught, he just forgets everything instantly, you know. There's no, there's no evidence on him to trace. Sort of like the old town crier approach, but now mental. You know, you can't, they can't read his mind. And perhaps the people, of, uh, the people hardest to crack are the ones that, well, whose minds go blank the fastest, I don't know which, may, may find the highest market value, you know, people trusting them the most, you know. You know. So uh, this is another way it could be handled. There are, there are, the market will find ways around the state um, in all cases. As long as people are are into, you know, their own their own thing. If there if there are entrepreneurs willing to take the risks, they will in fact find a way. Uh, and this now to end it up, end up the theoretical part. This is in fact the basis of the counter economy. It is why why hasn't it existed now? It is a change off. You're trading the security, the false security of the state. So that you think that if you comply with the regulations, all of which you can't, as we already pointed out. But if you more or less comply and you're more or less a good, good, good citizen or a good soldier schweich or whatever, the state will probably not come pounding on your door. On the other hand, if you do these, these, these evil and uh, vicious acts, uh, these crimes against man and nature, like buying a copy of New Libertarian Notes, uh, then you will in fact re, uh, re receive the wrath of the, uh, of the bludge. I'm s just simply saying that the risk you take what, just simply trade that security, that false sense of security for risk. You immediately, on the market, receive profit for risk. For example, if you perform a, a, um, a prohibited sex act, you get an immediate reward. If you, um, well, then you won't perform it. <laughs> perform another one. 
a different one. Use your creative imagination, Larry. <laughs> you must be an entrepreneur in this field. <laughs> okay, S seek an opening, so to speak. Okay. Um, <laughs> right. Okay. So you know the market provides, right? So. Um, if you, you exchange, in a sense, your security for a risk. Now, how big is this risk? That's the next question. I mean, if I, in fact, you know, pull out a J and light it up here, am I going to be busted 99% of the time? No. You know, I mean, everybody by now, or half of you have been in so many libertarian conferences, you know that's not the case. Uh, there are many, very many things you can do for a long period of time without getting busted. You can be one of uh, 600,000 or 5 million, depending on what figures for what purpose, who are not paying taxes, according to Ken, and you are not yet getting busted. Uh, the, uh, that statement by the IRS, by the way, is true, ultimately. Uh, the, state, the IRS does, re re uh, does depend on voluntary compliance, because every one of us, and I'm talking now a little, little larger group, but if, in fact, 20 million people, even 20 million people, did not pay their taxes, that's it. The IRS is, oh, cannot collect it. They haven't got the guns. And, and when it gets to the point where the soldiers aren't paying it either, you know, <laughs> they're not going to And, and this, this may sound really strange to you. I mean, the, you know, the, when I say the soldiers aren't, you know, the contradiction seems obvious, except that among Army welfare departments, Internal Revenue Service agents, for sure, uh, and so forth, I have, and, and police force, I have converted people. I mean, I've literally presented them with a the libertarian idea, and they said, great, and, you know, send in money and joined and so forth, agitated. A few of them eventually resolved their contradictions and, and quit their jobs. But, <laughs> but the point is that uh, these people, most of them, the enforcers, the bludge, the lower levels, are, very, are people who are not really aware and together and fully integrated with the society they're dealing with. And uh, while I will certainly not give up the right of my protection agency and my uh, laser or, or gun or whatever to uh, defend myself against an onrushing attacker, the fact that Mr. LeFave certainly has a point that most of the of these people, a large percentage of these people, can eventually, given circumstances outside of an outright shooting conflict at the moment, can ultimately be talked out of a lot of their doing. And especially if we offer them something like high profit and lots of dope and lots of sex and lots of whatever, you know, uh, a lot of them will come over. That certainly happened to a lot of soldiers already. Um, yeah, so I, uh, ultimately I see, I see this as um, it's going to work. It's working to some extent and it's going to work bigger and it's going to work all the way. Now let's talk about, since this is the background, let's talk about specifically what the topic was, which is what happens in terms of crises. How do I see counter-economics now applied to, say, the coming of crises? Let's take three of them uh, right offhand. Hyperinflation or, or crack-up boom, as, I like, as Mises calls it, and I love that term. Or um, the Depression, uh, real, you know, 1930s style. Or war. Now, I've put ors there, but actually I think it's and in all cases. <laughs> I think we're going to have a runaway inflation depression war. <laughs> all of them are coming, and all of them within you, not only within your lifetime, but within your youth. For those of you who still got... <laughs> <laughs> they came pretty fast and thick in the 20s and 30s. Between 1929 and 1939, you could have had them all. In 1929, there was a, high, a, a very high rate of inflation. Didn't go run away, though. You did get a fairly good depression, and by 39, uh, well, in the United States a couple of years later, you got a full-scale war. Um, and there were plenty of brush fires in the meantime. Well, I think it's all coming, and I, I think most of us know what, what's behind it. For those who don't, very quickly, uh, Austrian theory, if you, if the government starts inflation, and by inflation I'm taking the pure Austrian line, it means increasing the money supply, period. I don't care about the rate of goods production or anything else. The government is counterfeiting. That means they're stealing. Okay. Now, the effects of that are that prices tend to rise, you know. And, in fact, if they do it very fast, they create artificial booms. And if they then uh, cut back or, refuse or do not increase it further, there is the re recession that follows. If they try to get out of the recession by pumping in money into the market even faster to create another artificial boom, they get a worse recession later. And, you know, the old analog about shooting up with, and take a shot of dope and uh, you get hit, the, po the withdrawal symptoms afterwards are so bad you've got to shoot up again. But now the best you can do is just hold off the withdrawal unless you increase the dosage to get that high that you had before. So, of course, you keep increasing and then eventually either stop and go to a hell of a cold turkey, which is a hard depression, or you OD, <laughs> which is a crack-up boom. And the analogy holds in the economic system. 
Uh, but you can get pretty well most of what, you know, both of them, because you can have uh, spurt after spurt of uh, higher rates of inflation where the government sort of keeps trying to, or the um, inflate to get the boom going again, and then falling back, thinking, well, we've done it now, and boom, back into the Depression. And eventually, I think we're going to crack up. I think it is going to happen in this country. I'm, you know, we're willing to accept uh, estimates from uh, one year to five years to ten years to uh, 20, if you wish. And the people who are more specialists in that area can deal with it. But I'm convinced that the, uh, the power elite of this country has got a the situation which they can't handle. Natural law is staring them in the face. If they allow the Depression to occur, their power is shaken. The people are getting angry and uptight and rumbling. But if they let it go to a crack of boom, you better believe they're gonna, their power is going to be shaking because that has never happened in this country. People have lived through depressions, but uh, if, if money suddenly became worthless, Archie Bunker would freak out. <laughs> and the meathead, he'd be beaten up when we eat it. Um, so I think these are both coming, and I think the state will then look for the third way out, which it did in 1939 when nothing else worked, or 41 if you want to drag it out, which is war. And there, we've got plenty of good situations from Cambodia to, um, to the Middle East to uh, Japan uh, or anywhere else that uh, seems to be offensive at the time and people can be whipped up about. Uh, so what happens in these cases? Well, we've got Dennis to tell us about war, and we've got Chuck to tell us about gold. But specifically, what does the counter-economist do? What, what, what should the counter-economist feeling, Paulo Segoras, which, how should we feel about the coming of these crises? Well, I personally feel, you know, I'm jumping for joy, to tell you the truth. I'm, ch I'm very chipper about it. Because that means a lot of people, if, if the economy is rattled, people's minds open up finally. If things are going sort of all right, you know, the ache is dull. <laughs> it doesn't bother me anymore. <laughs> and I'm just sort of living with it for 10, 20, 30 years. And a guy comes around and says, I've got a great way to take away that ache in your back. And he says, what ache? <laughs> you know, he's become accustomed to it, right? Okay, uh, but if a suddenly a knee is suddenly kicked into his groin, you know, and you say, I've got a way to get rid of that knee, knee in the groin, he's very conscious that it's there at that very moment. And, you know, you can talk him into, uh, into listening to this new approach. And then you can throw in and say, oh, by the way, when you finish, we'll also get rid of that ache in your back, which you forgot about, you know. Okay, that's how, counter how I'm going to sell counter-economics. So, um, right now we've got all sorts of interesting knees in the groin. Now, the uh, you know, hyperinflation and a depression. Depression is closer to the backache, but the hyperinflation is definitely a knee in the groin to most people. And war is getting to an interesting point. I guess war is more like, instead of backaches and knees in the groin, is like a cancer of livers and, you know, sort of glands falling out because people die. You know. that, that tends to bring it, even if it's constant, it tends to keep bringing itself home every time a, a bullet rips some of your flesh or your friend's flesh or your parents' flesh or whatever. So, um, you know, people get worked up about that constantly. And um, all of these issues, we're on the right side, and we've got a good line. We've got a new line. The socialists aren't, aren't being bought anymore. Liberalism is going for a discount on the, on the nickel apple stands these days. And uh, conservatism is, uh, you know, just the retreat of a person who's absolutely frustrated with rage and can't think of anything else to say. So he says, let it be like it used to be. Because that's all he remembers or knows about. Um, and of course, once you teach them that there's something else like libertarianism, a lot of them come over. So at the end, libertarianism is, is, is coming up, it's getting popular. It's getting popular enough that Ronald Reagan and Willis Cardo are calling themselves libertarians now because it's, they figure the coinage is worth something. And I think the struggle is worth it for some of us to keep that name a little clear, cleaner and purer and meaningful than that, so we publish magazines. But, um, yeah, I think it'll sell. And I think that the opportunities that will arise in these conditions are, are going to be much greater than they would be if, in fact, I came to you 10 years ago or 50 years ago and told and started telling you about the same thing. And some of you, most of you, would not even be here if it wasn't for the coming crises that have already hit. Okay, if we weren't already in a depression, I'm, I'm, I call it a depression, we're in a depression now. The inflation is getting is, is a higher rate than the United States has ever had before. We never got out of the last depression. Yeah, one can argue that too. We never got out of the panic of 1819, if you probably asked Murray. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> in fact, we all rose from probably a depression that uh, King had in England back in the 1700s, I don't know. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's some people are very conscious about it. economics in everybody's mind. The, the left is no longer talking, you know, some of them are into ecology, but they're now willing to make concessions that maybe it should be done economically and not just on the basis of whatever, you know, three, a tree turned on their heart that moment, you know, and they say, well, throb, throb, that tree should be saved. They now think of, well, a tree should be saved by somebody who needs it and so forth, you know, or, or is willing to, uh, to conserve it. And, um, 
Yeah, economics is on almost everybody's mind. It's, it's the thing that's selling. So people are listening to us here, and people will listen to you if you're talking to other people. And what's your motivation to sell counter-economics like I'm selling it to you? Well, the fact that if you do, you've got one more person to trade with. Basically, you don't, have, you don't operate that way. When you go home, you're not going to go home and tell people, hey, I got this whole theory, and then you spout off in a half an hour of praxeology, and another 15 minutes, you know, of epistemology, so they got the praxeology straight, right? And then you might have to give them a, you know, a little bit of revisionist history to explain all this and so forth down the line. That don't sell too well. What you do is the other way around. You and him perform a counter, him or her, perform a, a counter-economic act. <laughs> After that, he may trip out and feel guilty, which uh, some people to the contrary, a lot of, a lot of counter-economists in this world do. And you uh, simply, you start telling him, you know, this is all right, man. In fact, it's great. You're heroic. You're hardcore because you've done this thing, you know. You've committed this act. And he says, really? How come, you know? I mean, he's trying to justify his existence, you know. He's trying to make himself look good in his own eyes. He says, builds up a self-esteem. You tell him that this low, shoddy, filthy act of black marketeering or sex or drugs that, he, that everybody tells him he committed, now you come up and tell him this is a wonderful, fantastic thing he's doing, striking a blow for the coming of the free society, you know. And he's, you know, he's much rather think of himself as a person who's striking a blow for the free society, and building up a, and, and uh, seeking justice and, you know, the truth, justice, and the anarchist way of life than, than being a... <laughs> one of these evil, filthy black marketeers or sex criminals or whatever. Okay, so he's going to, at that point, he asks you what's behind it in the philosophy, and then you tell him. <laughs> okay, once the market is created and the demand is there, then you provide the supply. And at that point, he says, yeah, I'm a good, moral, upstanding person. I'm a libertarian. I'm not a filthy, disgusting black marketeer sex criminal, you know. <laughs> and we, we sold another person, you know, and he goes out and pulls the same trick on someone else, and the counter economy expands. And the core expands, and libertarian consciousness expands, onward and upward. Until eventually we get to the point where Richard Nixon, well, not Nixon's gone now, but David uh, Nelson Rockefeller or whatever, the next time he's caught in a crime, will get up and say, no, no, I'm not a filthy criminal. I to, you know, I'm, a, I'm really a libertarian. <laughs> All, everything I did was right. <laughs> this was a blow to show you how corrupt the state was. <laughs> Watergate was all, was, all a plot, was all a libertarian act. I read Murray Rothbard 10 years ago. <laughs> I did this all, you know, whether or not he did, he'll try to justify himself this way. Uh, now, one of the things you may have noticed in my discussion is that the counter-economics is a way, is a, is a type of economic, political, whatever, psychological jiu-jitsu. I always use what the people want first and give it to them. This is definitely a change in my thinking. And I'm sure some of you have, who've gone through the evolution of the libertarian movement have had some changes in your thinking about it. When we came off of the right or the left or wherever in our proselytization, it is, was a totally different attitude. They have to see the right, they have to see the way, we have to put it on them, and then they'll be right, moral, and good, and the free society will come. The approach I'm taking now is totally opposite, and again, I believe more correct because it integrates and is more self-consistent with the idea of the free market, which we believe in. And that is to first provide, you know, provide, get the demand going, and then provide the supply. You know, first getting people into the obvious places where they're going to get something out of it, and then finding out that they want the philosophy to help them in their life. I mean, what does a person want a philosophy for? Why should you know how many dollar signs dance on the head of a pin? Because ultimately, it uh, straightens you out, makes you feel good, makes you live your life live better, and so forth. And you don't make as many mistakes and contradictions. So, there's the market and there's how we provide it. Okay, that's the basis of counter-economics. In the crises that come, there will be opportunities for selling it, There'll be opportunities, of course, in the actual commission of the act. So there'll be people more interested in buying it. Unemployment. Let's take a specific example. Unemployment. Right now, we are getting ravages, massive unemployment in this country. You know, it's growing and growing 9%, 10%, 12%, 20%. Okay. What do all these people want to do? Well, what, not all of them are going to go on welfare, for the simple fact is New York City is ODing on welfare right now. You know, they're getting to the point where they're going to cut back. They're going to have to. Even the greatest socialist utopian is not going to throw his salary into the pot, and that's all that's left. <laughs> you know? So we, we got, we're getting to the point of the, cri the critical mass is reached and this sort of thing, and eventually people aren't going to get enough. There'll be, you know, maybe there'll be riots and welfare right organizations striking. Unions are get, closed unions are getting, uh, you know, troubles. They're now asked to take cutbacks, not, you know, lower raises in negotiating, but actually asked to be taking cuts in pay and firing some people and things like this. The economic crisis is hit, right? Okay. Now, one thing we could offer, if we're all entrepreneurial, and we don't have to be, you can be labor capital, I don't care, but if you're entrepreneurial or minded, you will, once you start your business going and decide to have somebody else help you on it, you have created something called a job. Okay. Now, some people who are now out of work and uh, maybe want something a little better 
of uh, than simply standing in the bread lines for maybe or maybe not getting welfare, are going to find out that there are opportunities available by these, these what everybody else will call disgusting black marketeers, because somebody, some of them are looking for helpers or aids or work or whatever and they're doing. At which point, they now, uh, you know, they decide to take the dose. They'd rather get the money, even if it is supposedly filthy and dirty and all that sort of thing. And they, they, they get the job. As soon as they've got the job, they now say, I'm not a dirty, filthy, sex criminal black marketeer working at this illegal job, not reporting, not regulating, not being taxed. I am a heroic libertarian living the free society here and now, you know. <laughs> and of course, again, builds up our group and uh, increases the number of exchanges. One more person working, making money in the free society, buying goods on the free market, and so forth. We have to offer on the counter economy lower prices than anybody else with a higher return on investment. We can look, we can spend less on wages on now this is including wages plus you know if you think of the total package of wages plus social security deduction 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 etc we can offer less with more return to the worker so in other words work with the uh, the country econ economic businessman pays less the worker gets more keep the entrepreneur gets higher profits the capitalist gets a higher rate of return on investment the worker gets higher wages and the goods are sold at lower prices now compete everybody else in the market all of this is your trade for the risk you take in possibly getting busted. That's what we're selling. But that's the base of the counter economics. I think at this point we can hit questions.